ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया श्रीमद् भागवतम कैंटो 10 चैप्टर नंबर 22 कृष्ण स्टील्स द गोपीज गारमेंट्स एंड दिस इज टेक्स्ट 33 थ्रू 38 which ends the chapter. Aho e sambaram janma Sarve pradyupa jivanam Sujana sveva ye sambhai Vimukya yanti nart Dinaha Ahoy Sambaram Janma Sarvi Pran Yu Pajivanham Sujana Sweva Ye Sambhai Himukya Yanti Nartinaha Ahoy Sambaram Janma Sarve Prayupa Jeevanham Sujana Svevaye Sambhai Vimukya Yanti Nartinaha Ladies, Oh, oh, just see, Esham, of these trees, Varam, superior, Janma, birth, Sarva, for all, Prani, living entities, Upajivinam, who provide maintenance, Sujanasya, Sujanasya Iva, like a great personality, Ye Sam, from whom, Vai, certainly, Vimukya, disappointed, Yanti, go away, Na, never, Artinaha, 
Those who are asking for something. So Lord Sri Krishna is speaking to his cowherd boys and he's glorifying the trees. Just see how these trees are maintaining every living entity. Their birth is successful. Their behavior is just like that of great personalities. For anyone who asks anything from a tree never goes away disappointed. And it says here, this translation is quoted from Srila Prabhupada's Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila 946, verse 34. These trees fulfill one's desire with their leaves, flowers, fruit, their shade, roots, bark, and wood, and also with their fragrance, sap, ashes, pulp, and shoots. Text 35. It is the duty of every living being to perform welfare activities for the benefit of others with his life, wealth, intelligence, and words. This translation is quoted from Srila Prabhupada's Chaitanya Charitamrita 942, verse 36. Thus moving among the trees, whose branches were bent low by their abundance of twigs, fruits, flowers, and leaves, Lord Krishna came to the Jamuna River. The cowherd boys let the cows drink the clear, cool, and wholesome water of the Jamuna. O King Pariksha, the cowherd boys themselves also drank that sweet water to their full satisfaction. Text 38. Then, O King, the cowherd boys began herding the animals in a leisurely way within the small forest along the Jamuna. But soon they become afflicted by hunger and approaching Krishna and Balaram, they spoke as follows. Purport. Srila Jiva Goswami explains that the cowherd boys were concerned that Krishna would be hungry, and thus they feigned their own hunger so that Krishna and Balaram would make suitable arrangements to eat. Thus ends the purport of the humble servants of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 22nd chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled, Krishna steals the garmis, garments of the unmarried gopis. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadanti Swam Padantika Bande Ham Shiguro Shi Uta Padikamalam Shigurun Vaishnavam Scha Shi Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Scha Hey Krishna, Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandhu Jagatpate, Gopesha Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Namostute, Tapta Kanchina Gaurangi, Radhe Vrindavaneshwari, Vishabhanu Suti Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Vancha Kalpa Tarubhischa, Kripa Sindhu Bebacha, Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nithananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sivasadi, Gaur, Bhakta, Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So in the previous verse, to this series of verses, uh, Prabhupada makes a nice point that Krishna wanted to point out by glorifying the trees that even these trees are, they're so fortunate because they live completely for the welfare of others, for the benefit of others. Whatever they have, or whatever they are is for service to others. 
It's interesting how we see a tree as a, a living entity that more or less doesn't choose to be a tree <laughs> because it's under the control of the material energy, divas, karma divinatrena. One gets a particular body according to one's karma, but that's for the human form of life. And those forms that are below the human form, one transmigrates, or we say automatically, or by the arrangement of the material energy, which is what we say uh, programmed by the will of the Supreme. Mm -hmm. So, in that series of births leading up to the human form, one may receive a birth of a tree. <laughs> but yet a tree has been given a special, we might say, unique body where it can simply offer its existence to the welfare of others. And Krishna was so enthusiastic here to talk to his cowherd friends. He says, O oh, Stoka Krishna, Amsa, Sridam, Subal, Arjun, Rishabha, Hojasvi, Deva Prasta, Virup Tapa. And he, he's, he's calling them by name just to attract their attention to what he's about to say. He wants to make the point that how magnanimous and how magnificent a tree is. And Lord Chaitanya, of course, we hear that, that the tree, although it gives so much, it still undergoes a lot of physical, or when we say climatic difficulties. It has to withstand the difficulties of being a tree in the hot summer season when especially in the month of Jaist. Is that where we are now? We just passed that, didn't we? This is the month of Jaist, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's July, right? This is the Ashrata. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not too much heat because the rain has cooled things down a little bit. <laughs> but in some months, the months are so hot that the trees are sitting out in the hot sun. It's unbearably hot. Even human beings cannot withstand such heat and therefore take shelter of different arrangements. But the trees, what is their shelter? Their tolerance, that is their only shelter. <laughs> they become what we say tolerant. And Lord Chaitanya wanted to make that point in explaining what it means to practice the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. <laughs> One should be tolerant like a tree. Sometimes we even say, or we explain, not like a tree, but more tolerant than a tree. <laughs> so to understand that would, would mean one has to experience that. <laughs> because one can imagine what it means to be more intolerant than a tree. But Lord Chaitanya wanted to make this point so we could understand what, it, what are the qualifications for taking full shelter of Krishna's holy name. <laughs> uh, and the trees are the personifications of tolerance. Lord Krishna, he even compares, or at least the purport, the disciples of Srila Prabhupada, compare, or even probably, no, Krishna is actually comparing that they're even more tolerant than the brahmanas, or more magnanimous than the brahmanas, the ritualistic brahmanas, he makes the point, where they may perform various types of activities, but their rituals are understood for their spiritual advancement. <laughs> They look towards these things and perform these things in order to receive some gyan, some karma, some good karma, some gyan, and also traces of bhakti. <laughs> They're also there. But it's all about them. <laughs> 
Krishna is speaking this verse in the previous verse. We didn't read that verse. That was yesterday's class. Because he's about to approach the wives of the ritualistic brahmanas. He's actually about to approach the brahmanas first through the cowherd boys. But he wants to make the point that actually these trees are even more fortunate. He uses the word fortunate. Why would it be so fortunate to be in a condition of difficulty? Well, the, the apparent difficulty is material, but the fortune is that one has the opportunity to make one's existence for the benefit of others. Here, in the 35th verse, this is a verse that Prabhupada would often quote in his lectures. It is the duty of every living being to perform welfare activities for the benefit of others, with his life, his wealth, his intelligence, and words. <laughs> so, and Prabhupada would explain this verse by saying that one should give everything to Krishna, one should give their life. <laughs> that is perfection, and that leads to, you know, pure devotional service. But if one cannot do that, then one should offer something of one's wealth, some possessions, in the service of the Lord. And if one cannot do that, then one should use their intelligence to somehow or other speak about the Lord or to arrange things for the propagation of the Lord's message. In other words, using your intelligence to do things to help propagate Krishna consciousness somehow. And one cannot do that, then one can use, then one can just speak something or write something about the Lord, the words of the last one. So, but we know, and of course we understand, that um, devotional service, in order to become what we say complete or perfect or successful, one has to what we say, to use a very uh, undefinable statement, to give, one has to give everything. <laughs> what does it mean to give everything? It means to give back what is, what Krishna gave us. <laughs> Our very existence, very spiritual and material, is not separate from Krishna. <laughs> Our very existence spiritually is that we are Jivir Surupai Krishna Nityadas. So we are eternally and lovingly connected with Krishna. And that never changes, and that is our constitutional position. But then again, there's the material aspect of our what we say, a life, which is the manifestation of the material body and the extensions of the body which come in the form of everything around us or everything that is in the category of I and mind. My body, my wife, my friends, my intelligence, my words, my money, everything. But I and mine is part of the illusory energy. Janasa moham yamaham mameti. It's all what we say, an extension of my existence in the material world and has nothing to do with me, but has some value in its sense that it's a opportunity to be used in the service of the Lord. So to use everything in the service of the Lord means to give back to what Krishna gave to us mm -hmm. because even the activities we perform that are considered to be within the realm of pious activities are also the it is explained Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that he is ultimately the doer or the controller of everything both material and spiritual so one can only desire and Krishna can only will arrange things either directly or indirectly through the material or spiritual energy to make things, what we say, manifest in our life. So the credit we get from our own pious activities is also the facility provided by Krishna 
to perform these activities. So when we understand that nothing is independent of the Lord's energies and that the energies are always working in relationship to the Lord's desire according to our connection with those energies, both material and spiritual, then we understand there's nothing outside of Krishna. <laughs> Krishna is everything. <laughs> the materialists or even the pious living entities who perform some devotional service but maintain the mentality that my activities, pious activities and devotional activities are ultimately meant for my benefit. I, am, I become the center. In other words, just like they say there are two kinds of grihastas. Those who worship the Lord in order to please the Lord and, all the, and those who worship the Lord in order to get the benefits of worshiping in the Lord in order to facilitate their material happiness in this world. <laughs> the second category are more common that people worship God and this is pre pretty much seen in many of the religious societies that they pray to the Lord and offer prayers and puja and even uh, material things in the service of the Lord in order to facilitate a better material situation. <laughs> and it, this is seen today as religion. <laughs> One is considered to be religious or what we say engaged in religious activities if one is worshiping the Lord and somehow or other is making nice progress materially also. <laughs> In some religions they gauge your spiritual acumen, your spiritual strength by how much you are materially astute, <laughs> materially developed. <laughs> this is an indication that God is favoring you and therefore you should, therefore your activities are pleasing to God, therefore he's favoring you by giving you nice material things. Mm -hmm. So, but that simply leads to another birth. Somewhere in the material world, maybe at a better birth, but even if it is a better birth, it's also temporary and has nothing to do with the eternal soul's relationship with Krishna. Mm -hmm. So here, <clears throat> in quoting this verse, really, it's about offering everything to Krishna. Manaso deho geho yo kichu mor arpilu tu aupade nandikishor. Bhaktivedanta Kaur sings this song is explaining what is called saranagrati, or complete surrender to the Lord. That whatever I have, it's yours, and whatever I have, it is meant for your service. Mm -hmm. And that is the, what we say, that is the intelligent way to live life, <laughs> to use it in. <clears throat> whatever we keep for ourselves, whether materially or even what we say, the gain we get from spiritual practice. In other words, even in spiritual life, Krishna will, be, will benedict the living being by giving facilities which will allow the, the, the devotee to do more and better service. But if one becomes proud or enamored by the facilities that come by way of the success of devotional service, this is also a you know, Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur calls this Ranga Tarangini, one of the faults of devotional service. And one becomes, uh, one sees that the success of my devotional service is what the facilities that I receive by way of devotional service. <laughs> and this, this also causes one to become less enthusiastic and more dependent more dependent on the externals and not so much on one's what we say continuous cultivation of the mood of surrender 
And we see that at times where this facility that the Lord provides can work in the opposite way, causing one to become what we say, uh, what we say, less enthusiastic, because they see gain as material facility or position, power, influence, followers, whatever. These are all extensions of Krishna's mercy and to be used further in Krishna's service, that's all. <laughs> so Krishna wants to point out the glories of the trees and how magnanimous they are. They don't ask for anything and they only, apparently, as it's explained here, they have to undergo difficulties in order to exist as trees and to provide the service as trees. What are they giving? It says here they're giving everything. Their leaves, we use leaves for, what do we use leaves for? Sometimes we use them for making garlands. Sometimes people use leaves for designing things. They use leaves for banyan leaves, for eating. Banyan tree has these big leaves for eating upon. Flowers, we take the flowers we offer to Krishna, the fruits we offer to Krishna. The shade gives relief from the, the difficulties of the material heat and cold. Roots can be used, bark, wood, everything. And then the verse goes on. Krishna is speaking this verse. Their fragrance is very nice. Their sap can be turned into, what we say, maple syrup or honey. Ashes can be used. I remember when I was in the Brahmachari ashram in New Vrindavan, we didn't have soap. We used to use ashes for washing. So we would take wood ashes and use them as an abrasive for cleaning. And you could, we'd use that for cleaning the pots. It was very handy for cleaning pots. Maybe you're still doing that. And uh, we would also use it to wash our hands and even our bodies and even our clothes sometimes, which, which wasn't a good idea <laughs> because the, the color white would be a little bit off. <laughs> would come a little. So the ashes were also used like that. Krishna goes on, the pulp, in other words, he, he mentions everything that the benefit that the trees can offer. So we can learn, and in the 11th canto, uh, when Krishna speaks to Uddhava, he's describing the story of the Avanti Brahmana. And in that story, the Avanti Brahmana is speaking to, I believe it's King Yadu. Yeah, he's speaking to King Yadu. King Yadu is, what we say, fascinated by this personality and he wants to know more about him. And he describes, the Avanti Brahman describes how he lives his life, simply taking the messages of spiritual understanding from the external environment. And he mentions the water, he mentions the air, he mentions the mountains, he mentions so many things how one can learn spiritual teachings or qualities that are supportive or even directly devotional service. The sun, the moon, um, 24 different items are mentioned. Even Pingala, the prostitute, is mentioned. And that part of the discussion is the essence of the discussion because there's a whole section on how, by learning from Pingala's experience, what was her experience, she depended so much on receiving money from men who would come to enjoy her body. But in one experience, while waiting hours and hours and hours and conjecturing and speculating on who would come and 
Nobody came. Nobody came. And she needed money, finances, in order to maintain herself. So she was feeling very, very unhappy. But in her unhappiness, she went so deep into that unhappiness that she actually, you might say, became depressed. <laughs> But in her depression, somehow or other, Krishna entered into her heart and made her feel somewhat detached. She became completely detached from her lifestyle and the fruits that came by way of that lifestyle. And in that detachment, she became happy or peaceful. She was feeling very, very peaceful. And in that peaceful state, she became happy and even so much so that she was actually feeling the presence of Krishna within her heart due to that complete detachment from everything. So here, and of course, in that same narration, one can learn so much from life <laughs> if by observing carefully how Krishna is arranging everything for our spiritual advancement and for our purification. Sometimes we say nothing happens by chance. <laughs> the word Prabhupada never liked this word chance. <laughs> he dismissed it. <laughs> he said chance is, an, is, an, is a word that indicates you don't know what is really happening. <laughs> or it's something beyond the purview of your sense perception. Chance, he didn't like the word chance and he didn't like the word instinct. He didn't like that either. Instinct. Instinct is supposedly defined by the, by the definition as that one's, what we say, innate material nature. As we have an innate spiritual existence, we have an innate material nature. What is the, the, na the, innate, the instinct or the instinctive way to react to a situation that is indigenous or innate within my own nature? And Prabhupada never liked that because he said that actually it's super soul, not instinct. <laughs> it's Krishna within the heart. So this, what was the point I was making with chance? I got onto instinct. Oh yeah, for a devotee, nothing, nothing happens. What we say, there is a reason why something has happened. Or we can say, even if there's not a reason, we can learn from every experience. <laughs> And Krishna says, one who sees me in everything and everything in me is never lost and I am never lost to them also. So try, try to see, not trying to see, but trying to understand that within the material energy, Krishna is working to teach us and to purify us. So the example of the tree teaches a lot. It's a very powerful message. It's so powerful that Lord Chaitanya used that to make a very, very essential point in the process of devotional service. Tolerance. <laughs> Life pretty much centers around tolerance. <laughs> I think, I don't know, maybe from my own understanding, it seems like tolerance is prominent in the day-to-day -day life of a living entity. We have to tolerate so much. Or we have to learn to experience the process of tolerance in such a way that we make advancement from tolerating and from accepting what comes by way of material energy, by way of our karma, which is part of the material energy. Or there's another kind of tolerance, and that is by way of Krishna's direct mercy upon the, the devotee. Actually, in the, in the scriptures, there's two categories of tolerance. One is explained, Marta sparsas tu kuntaya sitnosna sukadukada agapayino nityas tamsti tiksiva bharata. 
This is the tolerance that comes by way of existence in this world, tolerating the, the kleshas, adiyatmic, adidaivic, adibaltic. Tolerance is the difficulties that come by way of body and mind, by other living entities, by higher powers. There's no choice. Materialists don't like this, so therefore they make arrangements to either mitigate the effects of these or somehow escape the effects of these, but you can't because one is under the influence of the material energy either in goodness, passion or ignorance. Even by raising oneself to the level of goodness, still one has to tolerate what we say the existence of one's material life, which is another form of suffering. Just to have a material body is the cause of suffering, even for a person in a mode of goodness. <laughs> And that's also temporary. But there's another kind of tolerance, and that is tate nu kampa shushimikshamanam bhujadeva kritam vipakam ridva vahubir vidadanamaste jiveti yo mukti padesha dayabhakti. And this is, this is very instructive to the devotees that the Lord, somehow or other, in order to show special mercy upon a devotee puts the devotee in some difficulty or some suffering. And how we accept that will make the difference of whether we actually make advancement from that or fail to take advantage of that. <laughs> uh, the common, what we say, or maybe initial, initial response to difficulty is why or sometimes trying to avoid that. That's almost human nature, but a devotee is a little bit above that, knows that, that Krishna sometimes, many times, arranges for our purification by creating some difficulties. <laughs> and the devotee sees that it's coming from Krishna and therefore he says, thank you. <laughs> And not only does he say thank you, but he appreciates the mercy. It's not like thank you because I have to thank you. It's actually thank you because you've actually showed me some special mercy. <laughs> so, and Prabhupada explains in one lecture that this verse is so essential for spiritual advancement that he says that we should learn this verse along with the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. <laughs> because without understanding the essence of this verse or the principles that govern Krishna's mercy upon the devotee in a, in a very, what we say, apparently unpleasing way, one will not understand the process of purification. <laughs> I mean, we all like to be purified the way we want to be purified, right? <laughs> That's usually the case. We have our own plan for purification. <laughs> and it's, we might say that's normal. That I'm going to perform my devotional service and I have my way of performing and I have certain expectations and I will serve in a certain way and, and this will happen and maybe some little inconveniences but I have my plans to get around those so but it just doesn't work like that <laughs> it just doesn't work like that and I, th I think many of the at least for the materialists they go through life waiting for the day when the material energy will work according to their plans. They're still working on that. <laughs> but it never happens. <laughs> As Krishna Prabhupada says, Krishna says, Maya Dakshena Prakriti Suyate Shachiratya. So for the materialists, the material energy always works contrary to their, what we say, ultimate material welfare. Because they lose everything in time and have to struggle so hard to get it anyway in the first place. But for a devotee, the principle of tolerance allows one to see Krishna within that. 
and to take shelter of Krishna. And by taking shelter of Krishna, within these, what we say, apparent difficulties, one becomes, what we say, purified and receives the shelter of the Lord. And that's the goal, ultimately. And so the tree can teach us so much. <laughs> the tree can teach us so much. It, its foundational existence, I think, was put there by Krishna just as a message for the whole world. Because, really, you can't find any living entity that gives so much and at the same time tolerates so, so many difficulties. <laughs> tolerates so many difficulties. There's a, there's a tree in America. I don't know the exact name of the tree. <clears throat> but they're really thin, small trees. And... Uh, in this area of America, which is called Denver, Colorado, it's in that Colorado area. It's in the uh, more like the far west, not the extreme west, but it's, it gets really, really cold during the winter time. It gets bitterly cold. I, mean, I remember, I'll, I'll skip that story because it's kind of boring how I experienced Denver, Colorado one time. But this, these trees, they had these, these, they're small trees, and they grow together in groups. But in the winter time, when it gets so cold, they actually, they wrap their branches around each other in the winter time. You can actually see that in the, uh, I guess, those who work with trees have explained, actually they do that, the trees wrap themselves together. It's almost like they're trying to keep warm. <laughs> We're getting support for each other. Uh, we hear how trees are really intelligent also, as Maharaj talks about how trees support each other in the redwood forest. We've heard that story many times. How they, they get strength and support from their roots underground. Uh, and where does that intelligence come from? <laughs> from Super Soul. <laughs> from Super Soul. <laughs> Their intelligence is not this, it's not that they discriminate, but they react according to their nature, guided by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because Krishna loves each living entity equally, no matter what body they're in, no matter what material condition they're in. <laughs> His love is perfect, his love is equal. So he always gives something to every living entity for their welfare, for their benefit, for their existence. And we can learn so much from nature. We can learn so much from nature. And nature just teaches us so much and because nature is working under Krishna's direction and the trees are and Lord Chaitanya says tolerant as a tree in order to fully take shelter of Krishna's name humility, tolerance, pridelessness and of course giving respect and honor to others according to their situation in other words honoring others accordingly but honoring others, respecting others. These are, the, these are the elements that make up the character of a Vaishnava. <laughs> and that's a character that has to be cultivated along with devotional service. It's explained that this verse, Trinatapi Suni Chena Tayori Vahi Suhishnana Amanina Mamanadena Kirtani Kirtani Sadahahi is the platform of remaining fixed in devotional service. Mm -hmm. By cultivating these qualities, one can stay steady in the process of devotional service, despite the reverses, whatever reverses come by way of situations or by way of Krishna's arrangement, whatever. Mm -hmm. By cultivating these qualities, one can always be, because when one takes in these, with these qualities, one can always find shelter 
in the Lord, in the holy name. And, and Prabhupada says that when one takes shelter of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, nothing can affect them. <laughs> it's a really difficult statement to really understand how by chanting the holy names of the Lord one becomes immune to the effects of the material energy or to the difficulties that come by way of executing one's devotional service. One can find complete shelter in the holy name. So therefore there is no greater shelter than Krishna's name, no complete shelter. In fact, Rupa Goswami explains that out of all the aspects of Krishna's manifested existence, his deity, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Vaishnavas, the holy name, <clears throat> two things, the Vaishnavas and the holy name are the most merciful. And actually, we might say the Vaishnavas are more merciful because they give the holy name. They give entrance into the chanting of the holy name. But the holy name itself is also more merciful than Krishna in the form of his deity because one who commits offense to Krishna in the deity form can only be freed from that offense by what we say seriously and what we say consistently chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So <clears throat> that's the good news, <laughs> the holy name. And the qualities that make up the character of a devotee who can perform the chanting of the holy name with success. And the very last verse changes the whole discussion here and the cowherd boys are now concerned that Krishna has been talking a long time and he's really, really hungry. So they act like they're hungry in order so Krishna will get something to eat. <laughs> That's love, right? That's love. <clears throat> you may not say, you, you might say, Krishna, you're hungry. You should stop and have something to eat. But Krishna might say, well, actually, no, I'm here to serve you, so I'm going to serve you. But if you say, well, Krishna, actually, I'm hungry, therefore, let's eat. And Krishna says, oh, you're hungry, so we'll eat. Okay. So that way Krishna gets to eat, and the cowherd boys serve Krishna by acting like they're hungry. In fact, yoga maya, this is a little bit different, but Yoga Maya would arrange for a demon to come at a particular time of the day in Vrindavan, and after Krishna would kill the demon, then it would be time to eat. Because the, the, the cowherd boys and Krishna would just play and play and play, get absorbed in so many games and so much playing that they would forget about eating. So in order to get them to take their lunch that their mothers so lovingly prepared, and that they're so eager to have, but they were more eager to, to play with their friends and with Krishna, that a demon would come by Purnamasi's arrangement simply to create, you know, a break in their play, and then after Krishna killed the demon, it was time for prasad. <laughs> time for lunch. <laughs> I guess after all that extra work, it's, you get a little hungry. <laughs> So this is Krishna, this is the cowherd's boy's love for Krishna. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Yes, Radhe Shyam Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, there is a difference between uh, tolerating on a material platform and tolerating in relation to Krishna. You know, so these two verses Matras Parshastu Kaunte Yashitoshna and the next verse Yambhina Vyatiyanti Iti Purusham Purusharshava Samadukka Sukam Dhiram Somra Tattva Ayakalpati So how does a person attain Amra Tattva simply by tolerating unless it is in relation to something that is Amrita Unless it's in a relationship to something that is Immortal Yeah I didn't catch that word Immortal Immortal Amra Tattva Amrita So Krishna is Amrita, mm -hmm. so unless somebody t somebody's tolerance is in relation to Krishna. Right. Material tolerance just leads to 
maybe more material tolerance. You can learn how to tolerate just so you can go on with your material life. But that's for the materialist. A devotee to tolerates the difficulties that come by way of material energy so they can stay engaged in devotional service. If the material energy causes us too much difficulty you know, in such a way that it may cause us to become, what we say, less enthusiastic or, or somehow rather slow down in our devotional service, then that's maya. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn how to tolerate the having a material body and the difficulties that come by a material body and so we can perform our devotional service and so on. That kind of tolerance. But the tolerance that Krishna arranges is usually in relationship to purifying us from some material attachment or some material conception or some wrong understanding. So that kind of tolerance purifies the heart and awakens spiritual knowledge. I guess what would be an example for that? I'm trying to think. You don't always get <clears throat> what you want in devotional. In other words, we sometimes, you know, we, we want the presence of Krishna. We want to experience Krishna consciousness in such a way that we can, you know, feel re Krishna's reciprocation. But sometimes Krishna just doesn't reciprocate at all. <laughs> or apparently he doesn't seem to reciprocate, but he's reciprocating by not reciprocating in such a way that he's tested. This is what he did to the gopis. He called them in the dead of night with his playing on his flute and they left everything to come to see Krishna in the forest and when they came, Krishna just sort of chastised them for coming and said, you are, you know, you're leaving your families, you're leaving your, your social uh, reputation, so many things will be, you're, you're being condemned, you're coming to see a young boy in the middle of the night, or young girls. And uh, what was Krishna doing to them? He was just glorifying them. To show their, their love to the world. So Krishna's well sometimes caused difficulty in order to glorify a devotee. That's what he did to Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada didn't need to get purified, <laughs> but still Krishna glorified him by giving him so many apparent difficulties to show the quality of his surrender and his devotion and his, his determination to spread Krishna consciousness. Like that. So that glorifies a devotee in such a way that people will understand that one can learn and take example from this one can come to the shelter of that person. One can be inspired from that person. But in, in our own day-to-day -day lives, sometimes in our execution of devotional service, you know, Krishna's not there. But he's just testing us just to see you know, how determined we are to stay steady despite the difficulties. Love means sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Without sacrifice, there's no love. Sometimes they say love be becomes where sacrifice begins. <laughs> so what do we have to sacrifice? Well, we have to sacrifice generally our, our misconceptions of what it means to practice Krishna consciousness. We have the philosophy, we have the understanding, we get the guidance, we have the association. But the purification comes in different ways. For instance, sometimes you expect something. Like, <clears throat> give an example, I guess. You do something and you expect some reciprocation from that. Like, but you don't get anything. 
like maybe you cooked a nice lunch and everybody was happy, but nobody said anything. <laughs> or you gave a class and everybody ignored you after that. <laughs> In other words, you do something and you feel like, wow, I feel like I'm, I'm serving nicely, but maybe Krishna's not seeing it that way. He might be seeing the false ego, but you're seeing it in a different way. So no, no reciprocation like that. Apparently no reciprocation. Just to kind of like help you to understand that devotional service is about pleasing the Lord and not receiving something from pleasing the Lord. <laughs> Krishna is a very progressive. Krishna is grateful. He's very grateful. But his gratefulness is shown in different ways. What is, his, what is the best way that he shows his gratefulness is that he gives us more and more opportunities for association of devotees and devotional service. That's his, his real gratefulness when he, he allows us to associate with devotees especially devotees who are more advanced to us. That's his mercy, and at the same time gives us a chance to perform devotional service. So a devotee is just thinking, how can I, uh, what can I give to Krishna in the form of devotional service, not what Krishna gives back for me by way of my devotional service. We all have expectations. But we'll be unhappy if we keep expectations. Called a Vetcha Sridhar. Always said. The Lord would chide him, sometimes get apparently angry at him, and even take his banana leaves and not pay for them. <laughs> but when the Lord called him, during the Mahaprakash Leela to come and to see that that same Nimai Pandit is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and to get the mercy. Kolavetsu Sridhar was simply happy by what the Lord had done to him before. He didn't want anything material. He said, you just continue to come and you know, buy my banana leaves and banana cups and banana plates and even harass me. <laughs> That's my happiness. <laughs> just to see your, just to see your beautiful transcendental form, I'm, be, I'm overwhelmed with happiness. He was just so happy just to see Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya is Gora Sundar. He's so beautiful. So just to get the darshan of the Lord is the satisfaction of the devotee, or the happiness of the devotee, not what the Lord can give like that. And the Lord always gives. But you know when he gives? When you don't ask. <laughs> Sometimes he gives when you ask, but usually these things come by way of maybe there's something that will be benefit in our service. But if it doesn't benefit us, Krishna won't give it. <laughs> but better not to ask. Better just to ask for service and acts to be purified through the service like that. Because we can perform devotional service and still be, what we say, under the influence of the false ego. And that's, that's devotional service still in a mode of passion. And Srimad Bhagavatam talks about devotional service in the different modes. Devotional service, actually, in the true sense of the definition, is pure devotional service. Savai pum samparo dharmo, yato bhakti ahoksaje, ahoituki apriyata, yayatma supersediti. That's really devotional service, but in, in a concessionary way, devotional service is explained with the element of bhakti mixed in with something else that is material. But that, element, that material element just pollutes the pure, pure process, and if it stays too long and is not eliminated, it will cause one to go down <laughs> like that. 
will go, go will we say, regress in the process of one's own. One's anarthas will start to come back again. <laughs> so, so devotional service is pure devotional service. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, thank you. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Shri Radha Gopinath Ji Ki Jai.